Welcome to the CHCI Leadership Conference Panel Session, Latinos and COVID-19, Beyond the Vaccine Phase. This session is possible due to the gracious contributions from our sponsors, Johnson & Johnson, United Health Group, Quest Diagnostics, and Walgreens. Our panel chair for this session is Representative Lori Trahan from the 3rd District in Massachusetts, who will give brief opening remarks, followed by welcome remarks from Joaquin Duato, Vice Chairman of the Executive Committee for Johnson & Johnson. Our moderator for today's session is Adriana Rodriguez, a health reporter from USA Today. She has been covering COVID-19, treatments, vaccines, and its impact on the U.S. health system and vulnerable communities since the pandemic's start. Please welcome Representative Lori Trahan. Hi, I'm Congresswoman Lori Trahan, and I proudly represent Massachusetts 3rd Congressional District. I am a proud member of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, and I'm honored to join you as we kick off today's session. These past 18 months have been incredibly difficult. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated existing inequalities of all kinds. Hispanic Americans have faced high rates of infection and death, leaving families and communities heartbroken. But over the past 18 months, we've also seen one of the fastest and most coordinated responses around a vaccine development and distribution in American history as well as rapid research and development of life-saving treatments for COVID-19 patients. The American Rescue Plan was critical in ensuring that these vaccines and treatments are available to all Americans, especially those in underserved areas, and in bolstering confidence in their safety and efficacy. While we've made remarkable progress in fighting this pandemic, variants such as Delta pose new threats and vaccination rates among Hispanic Americans remain low. To protect ourselves and our loved ones, we must double down on our efforts to ensure that Hispanic communities across our country have access to COVID-19 education, testing, and vaccines. Right now, we have a unique opportunity to build back from this pandemic better than ever before. And that means investing in an equitable future with positive health outcomes for all Americans. And the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute is leading that charge. I am grateful for their work to center the Hispanic community in the continuing battle against this pandemic and in our efforts to build back better. Well, now I'll turn it back over to the Institute for a discussion of the latest updates on vaccine distribution and ongoing treatment for COVID-19 and the impact on Hispanic communities. Thank you so much and stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Representative Barragan, for inviting me today. And thank you to the entire Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute for hosting today's session. Never in our lifetimes has the world faced a public health crisis like COVID-19. Despite the challenges, we have all worked hard to help develop solutions to tackle the pandemic. At Johnson & Johnson, we have a long-standing commitment to address global health crises. As many other organizations did, we mobilized quickly to respond. We have a responsibility to invest in solutions and are proud to contribute to the global response by undertaking a multi-pronged response including providing global access to a single-dose COVID-19 vaccine. While COVID-19 vaccines are increasingly within reach of all communities in the U.S., to reduce the severity of the pandemic, we must continue to build trust and confidence in their use. We are committed to playing our part in addressing vaccine hesitancy and educating communities on the benefits and safety of vaccination. Vaccine hesitancy is influenced primarily by three factors, confidence, convenience, and complacency. Poor or inadequate communication and information can contribute to vaccine hesitancy. That is why it is increasingly important to reach underserved communities to help answer questions and dispel myths about vaccines. As a company, our race to health equity aspires to help eradicate 
racial and social injustice as a public health threat by eliminating health inequities for people of color. And that includes supporting vaccine education. Our efforts help ensure healthcare professionals have all the information and resources needed to address consumer concerns on COVID-19 vaccination. We are focused on amplifying the voices that resonate within communities in need. An example of this is our partnership with the National Hispanic Medical Association and the Vaccinate for All program that trains and supports Spanish-speaking physicians around the country to speak with local and national media. Through this collaboration, we hope to help reduce vaccine hesitancy, build confidence in science, and address structural and cultural barriers to COVID-19 vaccine access in Hispanic communities. Although we have made tremendous progress, there's still a lot of work to be done. Continued conversations like today's sessions are critical. Thank you for the opportunity to kick off this very important session. Good afternoon and bienvenides a todos. My name is Adriana Rodriguez. I am a health reporter for USA Today. We have an exciting panel of experts here today to discuss critical issues on vaccine distribution the ongoing treatment for COVID-19 and how this impacts the Latina community. First, I would like to thank Congresswoman Lori Trahan for kicking off the discussion with her insightful comments and for the welcoming remarks from Johnson & Johnson's Joaquin Duato. And of course, thank you to CHCI for providing the Latina community an opportunity to engage on this issue. If you would like to continue the conversation on social media, please use hashtag CHCIHHM21. We have a great panel of experts who have been front and center on this issue over the past year. Joining me on the panel, we have Dr. Viviana Martinez Bianchi, an associate professor at Duke Family Medicine and Community Health. Hello, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this great panel. I'm Viviana Martinez Bianchi. I'm a family doctor and director for health equity in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at Duke. And I have been involved with the pandemic response as a co-founder of Latin 19, the Latinx advocacy team and interdisciplinary network for COVID-19, as an, and as an advisor on Latino health to the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you, Adriana, for the invitation. Thank you and welcome. Next, please welcome Rena Shaw, who is Group Vice President of Pharmacy Operations and Services at Walgreens. Adriana, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be a part of this panel. And at my role at Walgreens, I'm responsible for pharmacy operations and services across our 9,000 pharmacies, um, where we have our pharmacists and technicians providing vaccination, testing, and ad adherence services every day. In addition to that, um, I have co-led uh, the efforts on vaccine equity as well as health equity across the community and what we can do to ensure that we're providing equitable access, information, and care to all patients um, in communities across America. So thank you again for having me. Thank you and welcome. Also joining our panel is Dr. Jaime Murillo, Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer at United Health Group. Yeah, thank you, Adriana, and thank you to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus for the opportunity for us to be part of this distinguished panel. We look forward to a, a really good conversation about COVID in the Latino population. Uh, as an organization, as a physician, actually, from Colombia, I feel very proud of representing the Hispanic community within United Health Group, and likewise, feel very proud of representing the United Health Group within the Hispanic community. And um, also to talk about uh, all the uh, work that we at United Health Group have been done on behalf of the Hispanic community and behalf of uh, the people who initially took the brunt of COVID, everybody knows uh, those older than 65. Uh, we're actually privileged to serve more than 26 million Medicare uh, beneficiaries. Um, interestingly, 53% of the Hispanic uh, beneficiaries are, are part of United Healthcare, and we made sure that uh, they had access to testing at home, uh, 400,000 tests that were sent to them, treatment for flu, 
Uh, we also understood that there was not just a matter of, of uh, treatments, but also access. So we opened opportunities for the telehealth and we also have provided support in terms of food insecurity, housing, and so on. So we can talk more about it. I'm looking forward to it, uh, but uh, thank you again for this opportunity. Gracias y bienvenido. Um, finally, we're pleased to have Dr. Enrique Terraza, Senior Medical Director of Medical Quality at Quest Diagnostics. Hello, and uh, you know, I just want to start off by saying that I'm very honored to have been um, to be a part of this uh, panel and looking forward to the great discussion uh, with my fellow panelists. In my role at Quest Diagnostics, I'm uh, responsible for the quality of all testing um, that occurs, including for COVID-19. And as such, I'm, I'm really very proud to work at a company that has made major contributions to the pandemic effort. As a nation's leading provider of diagnostic information services, we've performed and reported over 55 million COVID-19 molecular diagnostics and antibody tests. Uh, since we began providing those services in 2020. And while that seems like a large number, uh, at the same time, it's not enough. We need more testing to effectively manage this part, this uh, pandemic. So thank you again, Adriana, and uh, look forward to the discussion. Absolutely. Thank you for your remarks. And welcome panelists, and thanks for joining us. <laughs> I guess uh, just to kick it off, um, you know, numerous reports have shown the Latina community has been disproportionately affected by COVID-19 compared to non-Latinas whites, right? Uh, a recent study actually from the University of Southern California found Latinas had starkly higher odds of hospitalization and death than white patients. So, um, uh, Dr. Martinez Bianchi, would you like to start on, you know, why do Latinas fare worse with COVID-19 compared to whites? Yes, thank you for this important question. We know that disparities in health outcomes arise from both health and social conditions. Latinx have a higher risk for severe COVID-19 disease secondary to increased prevalence of underlying medical conditions such as diabetes. For example, we, we know that Hispanics, 12.5% of Hispanics versus only 7% of non-Hispanic whites may have diabetes and then also obesity, which is quite prevalent in our Hispanic population. But there's also a myriad of social conditions that are driving the increased risk and disproportionate burden of COVID-19 and its consequences among the Latino community. Latino employees are overrepresented in frontline essential jobs, with half of Hispanic adults working at jobs that require them to work outside the home since February 2020, while many others had the opportunity to work from home. They were also more likely to live in densely populated and multi-generational multi-family households, making social distancing protocols very difficult to implement. And then also we see low insurance coverage fears related to immigration and deportation, especially last year, a lot of people were afraid that coming into the hospital would label them as a burden to the country and that for that reason they will be deported. We, see, we saw fear of being separated from their families at the entry to the hospital, the image of crossing the border between the, com the community and the hospital, the fear of separation, dying alone, uh, being away from their beloved ones also prevented many people from going to the hospital. Um, also going alone was not having the advocate, the person that often interpreted symptoms and cultural perceptions of illnesses. When we are going into the hospital, if we're sick, often we want somebody there with us to be able to, to share what is going on. It's, and it's not just about language, it's about that cultural interpretation. And then lastly, if we think about something that gives our Latino community that significant resilience is that family connectedness. The presence of large extended families and friends that are factors of resilience during normal times. During the pandemic, that usual source of strength proved to be a factor that increased the numbers of people falling ill with coronavirus. When the Pew Hispanic Research Center did a study on 
uh, who was being hospitalized, 64% of people knew someone who had died or was hospitalized among those who had tested positive for coronavirus. So Latinos tended to live with families, help others, and the more that we helped others and brought them into our homes or took care of their children actually caused more of the transmission of the virus. Um, so those are just some of the social determinants of, of the problem that we're seeing um, and it, something that we need to think about and work together to mitigate as a community. And that's interesting. You mentioned uh, sort of briefly about insurance. Dr. Murillo, would you be able to sort of elaborate on how cost could also be a barrier? Uh, yes, uh, in general, uh, fortunately, uh, under the emergency uh, use authorization, uh, they, the treatment and testing are covered. And for those who have insurance, in our case of United members, we have no cost. We make sure that everybody has zero cost associated with um, either uh, testing or uh, treatment, including the hospital stays when, when they are needed. So from that standpoint, um, I don't think uh, that should be a barrier. I think that Dr. Martinez Bianchi clearly um, uh, spelled out all the different um, problems that we have and why the Latino community is um, at a high risk, uh, both uh, uh, both as a, as a host from the clinical standpoint, but also that social component. And more importantly, I think something we can talk about more in this, this panel is the, those cultural beliefs of how people perceive prevention, how people perceive uh, testing, and also the intrinsic part of the cultural change being in a country where they may not feel um, uh, comfortable seeking care um, for uh, conditions like COVID. Absolutely. And to even get access to these treatments, right, we have to have a positive COVID-19 test, correct? And, and that's where we have issues as well with testing. Um, for example, a Stanford study published in May found the Latina population had undergone testing at a lower rate in California, despite facing a greater risk of exposure and suffering more deaths than any other race or ethnicity in the state. Um, Dr. Terrazas, uh, could, you a little, could you elaborate a little bit on the importance of testing and possibly why the Latina community lacks that access there as well? Absolutely. Um, you know, the importance of COVID testing cannot be overstated. It's vitally important for the efforts to curb the pandemic from identifying infected individuals for isolation to contact tracing. And as was mentioned, as an entry point to treatments and therapies for COVID-19, including monoclonal antibodies that may prevent or even treat serious illness. However, we do have challenges in the Latina population, as you pointed out. And there's also recognition of the disparities within the community. You know, for example, uh, a health, um, a Quest health trend study in conjunction with the Harris poll last year demonstrated that Black and Latina Americans are nearly twice as likely as white Americans to say that their access to COVID-19 vaccines, treatments, and healthcare is worse than, uh, than other racial ethnic groups. So what can we do? You know, there's both a perception problem as well as well as real data that shows that there's barriers um, to the uh, access to get COVID-19 testing. And I think there's a few things that we can do. You know, we need to partner with community groups um, that are making efforts to address the health disparities. And we need to partner with trusted voices within the communities to communicate the importance of testing and also to combat misinformation that may have spread and we also need to assist individuals that have a language barrier or don't have ready access to internet and technology to assist them in scheduling appointments and guiding them to testing sites or assisting them to get home collection kits. And, and we need testing centers in the Latina communities and, and Spanish language resources. And as an example, you know, Quest has introduced Es Tu Poder, a Spanish language webpage with information about COVID-19, including testing. So th with these efforts and more, we could go a long way to improving access to testing in, in this uh, Latina community. I appreciate that. And Rena, would you like to add anything to that, you know, for companies like Quest and Walgreens, you know, what, what's the social responsibility that you guys have to increase testing? 
Yeah, I think, um, first of all, all of the panel, like everyone has spoken about this, um, you know, when we think of healthcare in general, um, we already had somewhat of a fragmented institution where um, the ones that really were given care, they were given exceptional care and they had access to it right away, not worried about, you know, cost or access to care or whatnot. When COVID-19 actually hit, we saw um, many of our communities that are were already impacted with health care, um, lack of access to care, um, being impacted that much more. And so the minute COVID-19, the pandemic hit, um, we recognized that there was an important aspect that we needed to think about when we rolled out services. And testing was a key component of that, especially at the very beginning. We needed to know, um, all of us needed to know who was positive, who wasn't, and how do you contain a lot of the, the efforts that Dr. Martinez Bianchi had mentioned earlier. And so with vaccine, with um, testing, what we had done was we looked at our footprint and across the 9,000 stores we have, 40% of our locations are already in medically underserved areas many of them in black and brown communities and Hispanic communities. And so the first thing we did was rolled out testing in those communities first, because we knew that access to testing services was critical in order for us to be successful here. Um, that required our pharmacists to be trained in providing testing services. That required our technicians. We, we didn't have technicians at the very beginning trained, but now we have technicians trained to do so. And it required partnership across the community because we couldn't do it alone. And and so now we have around 6,000 sites across the country that have testing services, about 40 to 50% of them in locations that we know are medically underserved and um, really combating the access to care piece. The second piece was trust. And I think everyone described it earlier. There is a barrier, there is a perceived barrier to cost. There's a perceived barrier to making sure that you had access to care and that you wouldn't be deported based on what you actually gave your information to. And so it was important for us to ensure that we created a private, secure environment so that everyone could trust you can come to Walgreens get your testing services, get vaccinated, and not feel like your security was compromised. The second was the importance of getting tested and why that was important to do that on a continual basis. And so we have our pharmacists sometimes are the only healthcare professional in a community and they've created a bond with our patients. And so we leverage that trust so that we can ensure that our patients could come to us and feel confident and get the right information that they needed. And then the last was making sure that they understood that there is no cost. Um, as you know, Dr. Morello said, there's no cost to getting tested, getting vaccinated, and we had to ensure that we shared this, but it wasn't just us, leveraging faith-based organizations, leveraging thought leaders in communities to help share the same message and partnering with our local leaders to ensure that everyone understood that they could come to Walgreens, get tested, get their information back to them and not feel like they, you know, they didn't have resources to be able to support that. Absolutely. And going, oh, go ahead, Dr. Morillo. Yeah, no, thank you, Adriana. I just want to tag on those comments because I think Dr. Terrazas and, and, and uh, uh, Rina just mentioned three key words. Uh, one was access, the other one was partnership, and the other one was trust. And that's a key component of uh, any strategy that we make in this space, especially when we talk about communities that have um, lack of equity. Uh, and, and so, uh, well, every organization has made an effort. Of, I mentioned at the beginning how we reached out to our Medicare beneficiaries. One of our uh, biggest uh, programs that we're very proud of, is we call it a Stop uh, COVID, and it was actually designed for the community. It was not just for members of United Healthcare, but we understood that uh, one of our priorities is building healthier communities. So we set up shop literally across several sites um, across the country. In, in areas where people were underserved. As Rena mentioned, there are people who don't have access really in their own environment. And we provided an area where they could get free testing, but also we understood it was not just about the testing, it was about safety kits. It was about uh, information. We partnered with community-based organizations. We partnered with federally qualified uh, health centers. So we refer them when we needed to. And we also provided, thinking of the Hispanic community, translation service. I very well remember a, a case when we put a shop in Philadelphia and uh, one of the first uh, uh, people that came to the, there was a family from New Jersey. 
they were desperately looking for testing sites that were free. Obviously, uh, they, they couldn't afford and came to us. Unfortunately, we had anticipated that need, so we had translation services. And then from then on, we had, we had vans of uh, Hispanic workers coming to us uh, to be able to uh, gain access to that. So th I think that partnership, that trust through that partnership and providing access, especially when people who are um, don't have access because of, of cause or because of fear, that is a key um, component of it. So I'm, I'm very glad to hear that all four of us are really aligned in how we, we approach this. Totally. And kind of going off of that, um, going off of, um, you know, trying to build that trust, right? And trying to uh, put it out there that, you know, this doesn't cost anything, uh, that we have uh, support here for you. I mean, the way to get that to through them is with messaging, right? And this is sort of similar to outside of the Latina community where we have sort of different messaging going on in the pandemic because things are constantly evolving, right? So how, I guess, can we get the Latina community to trust the messaging that it is important to get tested even though, you know, maybe in the beginning of the pandemic, that wasn't the case because we didn't have supply or whatever, uh, what other cases it was. I, I think that regardless of the messaging, what we first need to work on is a key reason for the dramatic COVID-19 infection disparities affecting our Latino community is that they have been systematically excluded from access to health services, health information networks, and access to insurance, even when eligible. So we need to start messaging about what was not right even before we got to the pandemic, right? There is access, there, there is a, a need for, for looking at who is not included in insurance plans, which works will actually provide them. And so get connected to those health insurance plans. Those were some of the pre-existing barriers that are structural, economical, political, geographical, that are that were the setting point in where we then put the pandemic. So similarly to what we saw in access to vaccine to COVID COVID-19 information and testing, we are also we also have been seeing in the vaccine distribution and in the the trustworthiness, you know, communities, uh, what I why are you now paying attention to us when you didn't include us before? So being part of this voice and this message as a, as a Latina for me is extremely important that we need to identify the barriers and bring our community into understanding what is available for them, what is accessible. We also have to fight a pandemic of misinformation about the risks of the vaccines, about the risks of the of the um, treatments, um, how may, many of them think there may be a tracking chip on the vaccine, uh, how they may magnetize people, a concern for infertility, a concern for uh, the damage of a fetus if moms are pregnant. So we have to, one of the issues here that we have to recognize is the lack of enough Latino physicians and nurses and we have to promote our communities to get in, into health professions and then work together with community members to fill airwaves with information in Spanish and in culturally competent manners. We need to act as role models in getting our own vaccines to mitigating fears with culturally relevant information in Spanish and participating in everywhere we can, including this place, right? To inform our community so our community understands that there is access, that it is safe, um, and then collaborate with hospital system, health departments, community and faith-based organizations and businesses to host vaccination and testing events. We, we thought we didn't need to test anymore. Now we're having to test again because we're seeing this big surge in the Delta variant. So it's, it's getting the access to vaccines and testing and monoclonal antibodies closer to where the community lives and work. And I'm glad that you mentioned monoclonal antibodies because I sort of wanted to go back to that when we were talking about treatments. That's extremely important to prevent severe disease. Um, could you, for those who don't know, kind of explain what that is and why it's important, sort of like also how it's, uh, how it's given. And it is a little bit of a process, right? <laughs> 
So monoclonal antibodies are immunoglobulins, antibodies that neutralize the virus by binding to the spike protein. So it, it is given either through an IV or through a shot, um, and it prevents the virus from attaching to the receptors and then being able to really affect the body of the person that has been diagnosed with coronavirus. And I'm think uh, this is very important. It's only, it works well in the first 10 days. So we have to get early diagnosis. And for those who are having mild to moderate symptoms, and it can reduce uh, the risk of hospitalization, emergency department visits, and death among patients with mild to moderate COVID symptoms that receive the IV infusion of antibodies or the shot by 70%. It is not as effective as the vaccines. Vaccines are first, the, the first line of prevention, but then we have a, a line of treatment, the monoclonal antibody, to help those who have early disease and um, are moderately or mildly ill, not those who are very severely sick already in the hospital. And in addition, um, that it's, it's indicated for people who are at a higher risk. Now, like I said before, and many of our Latino members of the Latino community may be at a higher risk due to obesity, due to immune, immune suppressed uh, uh, conditions, and also due to diabetes. And so that, those are just some of the, the, the issues. Access is limited. Again, part of that, the same that we were seeing with access to testing has been repeated in access to vaccine and, and now in access to monoclonal antibodies. That excessive reliance that Dr. Terrazas was mentioning on technology to be able to register for something. A lot of the information about monoclonal antibodies tells you to talk to your doctor so that you get referred to an infusion center. Well, a lot of people don't have access to their own primary care physician that will refer them. Although there are ways to self-refer by calling infusion centers and the federal number, um, and there is a line in Spanish. So we, we need to get that information uh, more, um, uh, you know, closer to our communities. And you mentioned vaccines, and I do want to sort of spend the um, spend some time on them because they are the best way to prevent severe disease, right? <laughs> Before even getting sick in the first place. Um, and we we already talked about how there was sort of a lack of access there, um, misinformation, distrust. Um, Dr. Murillo, is there sort of a way to overcome this? Uh, the answer is yes, um, and um, I was thinking that, you know, in the United States, we have such an advanced uh, uh, science that we very much focus sometimes on crafting messages based on science. And we don't realize that when it comes to the Hispanic community, for instance, and, and that's true also for other cultures uh, and, and other groups, but it, let's talk about the Hispanic community. In addition to the message itself and based on the science, it really has to have two components. One is, what is the cultural component of the message, which is, Hey, the same thing that what you need, the reason why you need the vaccination is uh, because you want to protect your abuelita, is because you're a high risk and, and, and you don't want to end up in the hospital, is because you're going to be losing work days if you, if you, don't, if you get sick and, and so on. And then, you know, mitigate all those fears that uh, many of us in, uh, have, have talked about in the, in the previous conversation. And then the other part is who delivers the message, the trusted messenger. That's a key component of it. So here's where I'm going to uh, say a couple of things. One is the workforce that Dr. Martinez Bianchi was mentioning too. So we need more representative workforce that can communicate with people. Uh, for instance, the United, since over the past 15 years, we've been the United Health Group Foundation has been giving grants to underserved um, representatives of communities that could go into healthcare uh, training and, and become doctors, become nurses, and so on, because we believe that diversifying that workforce is important to connect with the patients, right? So number one. Number two is that partnering that we talked about. It is, and I'm going to make a special call to the media, actually. I think the if you think about it, the Hispanic depends a lot on watching TV, and and this goes to you, Adriana, <laughs> and, and reading the uh, Spanish uh, uh, press and media. And, and if we get the if we partner with them, to listen, please tell them that this is important. It's not just United or is Walgreens or, or Quest or other or, or, or the doctors saying this is important. 
it really is trusted messengers. So I think the, the media has a role to play as, as do other community-based organizations that people trust as their um, as their uh, to deliver that that message. So that's that's uh, thank you for asking that question. Absolutely, messaging is so important. And Rena, as you know, I'll come back to you for this since Walgreens is one of the country's uh, you know biggest pharmacies that offers vaccines. You know what what can we do to uh, increase access on your side? Yeah, I, I think that um, it's such a key component of uh, if you don't. If you can't get to a site to get vaccinated, um, that's already one barrier. So you know you can go ahead and be able to you know um, dispel all the mistruths that are out there. But um, if you don't, if you can't get to it, then it's uh, it's definitely an issue. And what we've done in the last couple of months, actually in the last year and a half, we've definitely taken our access approach a step further. We have our, our 9,000 locations, like I'd mentioned, our, our pharmacists and our technicians, which are over 60,000 pharmacists and technicians that are administering vaccinations and testing services. Not only do you, can you come into any of our stores and get vaccinated, but we've actually made the effort to go out into the communities. We've hosted over 1,300 off-site clinic so that we can ensure that patients got vaccinated. And these weren't clinics that were, you know, in areas where we know transportation is not an issue. It was actually in areas that we knew that required more equitable access to care, utilizing, um, you know, information that we were getting from our local leaders. Um, as uh, we talked about before, uh, when we think of individuals that are providing these services, you need to build trust. And the best way to build trust is making sure that your providers are reflective of the communities that you're serving. And at Walgreens, we have 45% of our, of our team members are actually um, of a diverse background. They're people of color. They're coming from the communities that they're serving. And so what's the best way to ensure that you're able to instill trust? You instill trust by knowing that the same individual that is providing the vaccination is right there next to you, living in your community every day, all day. And so by offering vaccination services, testing services in our locations, as well as at these offsite clinics, we were able to increase access to care. But the second piece was around um, building trust was the partnership that we've uh, been able to form with faith-based leaders, with community leaders. But then also, I think, you know, Dr. Murillo said it um, really well, uh, leveraging media as we can, leveraging partnerships when we can. So um, even our partnership with LULAC and being able to utilize Telemundo to get the message across to help everyone understand the importance of vaccination was critical so that we can ensure that we're utilizing all aspects and messaging. Um, our our the community leaders in our stores, our pharmacists, our technicians, as well as being able to leverage partners across the continuum to ensure that everyone understood the importance of vaccinations. And we've administered over 30 million vaccinations and a third of them, 10 million, are actually two individuals of a diverse background. And so we know that we've done a great job thus far, but there's so much more we can do. And you know, we're awaiting the booster information any minute now. And we know that we're, it's gonna be another flurry of information we're gonna have to get out to our Lat, um, Latino communities to ensure that we're, we're continuing the traction that we've begun. Absolutely, if you wanna reach out, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I just wanted to underscore the, you know, the importance of messaging. You know, the Native American community was able to drive higher vaccination rates by framing vaccination as a way to protect the tribal elders. So, you know, if we can message similarly, you know, vaccination is a way to protect your abuelita, a way to protect your abuelita, maybe we can be a little bit more effective in, in the Latina um, community. Absolutely. And best way to reach Abuelita, right, is um, is uh, reaching out to uh, to the stations playing those telenovelas all day, right? Yes. Um, I do want to talk about <laughs> I do want to talk about um, the uh, leaders in the community, right? Uh, community health workers, especially. Can we talk about sort of their role and how we can best support them? Uh, Dr. Terrazas, I don't know if you want to start. Yes, um, you know, as, as, as I was mentioning, um, community health workers, you know, would be a, um, an ideal way of reaching uh, the target um, uh, community. Um, you know, they can go in, um, become a trusted uh, member of the community, 
um, and have ready access to all the information that's needed, you know, testing sites, testing locations, you know, how to um, sign up for uh, appointments. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think even more importantly, combat the misinformation that's out there concerning vaccination, concerning treatments, and concerning testing. Um, so, um, go ahead. I have Dr. Martinez Bianchi. Yeah, so I have seen, I'm very familiar with the North Carolina Community Health Worker Initiative and the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services for this year deployed more than 400 community health workers in 50 counties. Then it was so successful that it expanded it to all 100 counties. One of the things that I, 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 I'm very proud of seeing that the number of Latinos vaccinated in the state of North Carolina is higher than for other groups. And in particular, anywhere where community health workers have been participating that are members of the Latino community, we have seen a significantly higher uptake of vaccines and testing because of their presence. Community health workers are members of the community who are, um, they, they have been identified, some of you may know them as promotoras, right? That was the, a name that started early on. And because of their trusting relationship with the community is that they can actually be that nexus between health systems and health departments and the community and earn their trust. Great. And thank you so much for everyone. This was an amazing discussion. I think we have enough time to go to Q&As here. Uh, we can start with this one here. Uh, that's ask, you know, what uh, strategies do we need to put in place for the next pandemic to ensure Latinas are not disproportionately impacted? Information accessible in the language and in culturally relevant ways paying attention to community needs. We started a pandemic response that started inside the hospitals as opposed to starting in, in the community. We should have a community, a, a, a viral illness that spreads in the community needs a community level approach. It's bringing together people on the ground with the communities understanding what's going on to prevent the end, the transmission and the entry of people into hospital systems. And I would probably, great, great to build on that, I would add that. Um... <laughs> Go ahead, Mina. Oh, as, uh, I was going to build on that to say, um, you know, there's not one silver bullet that will solve everything. Um, you know, th there needs to be partnership across the entire supply chain. Even on this panel, you see there's, um, at, you know, research, academia, uh, the payer, you know, organizations, you have um, lab, you know, lab organizations, supply chain, government, everyone needs to have the same message. And in addition to that, we need to ensure that there's thought leaders across the entire continuum to do that. And what we've learned through this is that the level of trust that community um, professionals, may it be our pharmacists and technicians, may it be the community health organizations, the level of trust that there is is so high that we need to utilize that first to help educate and and break down all the mis the misinformation that was out there and i think at the very beginning of the pandemic what was happening was there was too much information that you couldn't distill what was accurate and what wasn't and so how do we leverage the the in the individuals that understand the science behind this and be able to embed them in communities across america so that we can ensure that they have the right information at the right time um and so i completely agree with dr martinez bianca in the fact that there's there's value in leveraging the community leaders there um to provide the right information at the right time yeah, and I will just add 30 seconds to that concept. In general, I think we, if we address equity, we're going to have a lot of problems solved. And in our our mission, we talk about equity as being a measure of our of the success of our mission. And our mission is to make people live healthier lives and make the system work better for everyone. So if we address equity, that's how we're going to um, uh, achieve that um, the mission of making sure that everybody in the community regardless of their uh, credo, age, gender, sexual orientation, uh, economic status, uh, education status, immigration status is is healthy. And, and addressing equity 
it has to be a group, as, as Rena said, it, uh, a partnership. And it is not just based on the purely medical aspects of the clinical, but more importantly, the, the social aspects of it, the housing, the education. We know that Latinos had the lowest level of high school education. Talk about a long-term opportunity. And then, and then in the short term, we have, we have other opportunities that we have already addressed. Absolutely, yeah, thank and, you. And, and I really like, oh, go ahead. No, oh, I just wanted to add that uh, and, and underscore the need for information, as was mentioned. So to get the information that we need, we really need to um, continue and increase uh, funding for public health uh, so that we can gather the information of, um, you know, who is positive, what are the positivity rates in, in our various communities, and, um, and how do we aggregate the data to provide meaningful statistics and information for the communities to, um, to institute responses um, where uh, disparities um, exist. Uh, so definitely information is one thing that we need. And I, I wanted to underscore just the equity um, that uh, Dr. Murillo um, um, uh, underscored as well. You know, we need to continue to fund uh, federally qualified health centers that deliver health care to our most vulnerable communities. And, and then we need to do more. Um, you know, for example, Quest has created and funded a Quest for Health Equity program, which supports efforts at reducing health disparities in underserved communities. And as an example, you know, we've partnered with an FQHC in Puerto Rico, Salud Integral en la Montaña, aimed at improving post-COVID care. So we need more programs like that. We need information, and we need to be able to utilize that information to direct uh, testing, you know, vaccination, et cetera, where it's most needed. Absolutely. And I appreciate the service de Isla del Canto. <laughs> um, one question <laughs> that I really like here, <laughs> one question that I really like here, and it's um, not, we can tailor it to the Latina community, but it's uh, despite this being one of the fastest and most coordinated responses around vaccine development and deployment in American history, what are some lessons learned from deploying the COVID-19 vaccine? Um, I, I can start and then um, we can have the other panelists join in. Um, so one of the biggest lessons that we learned um, through through the entire effort is that um, this was definitely probably a couple, but one was that this was um, this required all hands on deck in order for us to get that fast response. Um, we needed to ensure that between the, the private and public sector that everyone was working together. Um, I, you know, we spoke about equity. We, we stood up a vaccine and testing equity task force and we did it within minutes. Um, it wasn't something that we had to debate. It was something that we had to stand up quickly. And so speed and partnership was a key component of that. The second was that this was much more of a marathon than a sprint. Um, as much as we were working fast, um, it's, it's hard to believe that it's been um, 18 months that we've been going through this pandemic and um, the economic hardships that our, that our team members, our people were going through, that the community was going through, the lack of information or the abundance of misinformation was out there. Um, there was just a lot of different moving pieces that were both on the emotional side as well as what was happening on the, the clinical and health side. And so one of the biggest areas that we underscored that we highlighted was mental health, that the mental health of our organization, the mental health of the communities and the patients that we were serving was something that needed to be highlighted and, and prioritized through this entire effort. And so when we think of um, equity, health equity, um, it wasn't only just making sure that we offered testing services and vaccine services. We also offered being able to be a, a resource for mental health and being able to be a resource to help understand how do you navigate if you do lose your job? How do you navigate if you needed to go to other places? And through the pandemic, we realized how important that was so that if this ever happened again, that we continue to invest in resources like that. Thank you. I and I kind of want to, oh, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I thought about three potential ways of doing it. Step one, you need to create, we need to create and facilitate spaces for expanded conversations about the disconnect between certain communities that are systematically excluded from healthcare networks, from the existing health system, 
and together with the communities, identify gaps in healthcare access, information, and barriers. That's one. Number two, we want to partner with grassroots organizations, health system representatives, and payers, and assess alignment of the community needs and the available healthcare resources. What is needed? What is not there? How do we fill that gap? And then third, we want to use community voices and identify community uh, you know, trusted people to propose changes in health system policy to advance efforts, align care delivery models that include those communities. We cannot continue to think that we're going to take care of people in with the existing healthcare delivery system that we have. We don't have universal access to healthcare. I think in this country, with the wealth of this country, and especially for the Latino community, such a hardworking community, not having access to healthcare, it's almost like a parody. Totally. Yeah, and I, I just want to end it with this one that. question. I'm sorry. Um, I just, <laughs> I really like this question because I've been looking for this data too, and I can't find it. Um, are we seeing different rates of vaccination from di different segments of the Latina population, such as Mexican Americans, Salvadoran uh, American, Puerto Ricans? Is this being tracked? We should probably be tracking this. We're not a monolith, right? Yeah, we as, are not a monolith. as of right now. It... <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, okay. I, I mean, we were probably going to say the same thing that you know, um, it, it it should be tracked down to that level of detail of exactly who's getting vaccinated. So you then you understand which strategies we need to implement um, and which where do we see gaps. Um, and the data that we've seen, we haven't gotten down to that level of um, detail either. We haven't seen that, but um, I don't know if Dr. Martinez, Bianchi, or um, the rest of the panelists, if, if you've seen that. Dr. Morillo? Yeah, I recently saw a paper in JAMA. I recently saw a paper in JAMA where they, they uh, actually tracked uh, uh, and separated Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, South Americans, and so uh, different different responses. Um, I don't. I, can, I think we don't have time for the details, but but yeah, that's is, is that work has been started, it, which also gives us a little bit more granular on how we can be. It's not just about Hispanics, uh, uh, but also what are the different sectors that within the Hispanic population, and, and that will help us again craft that message in in a, in a better way, especially when it comes to vaccination. Right, because Puerto Ricans, Mexican Americans, Salvadoran Americans, we all have different experiences in this country. We all mm -hmm. see different things different ways and we all have different media outlets as well. So definitely very important to track that um, and see where each of us sort of uh, lie on vaccine hesitation or vaccine uptake, anything like that. Um, but thank you so much to our panelists uh, for, um, you know, uh, for participating in this amazing discussion. Um, I'd like to bring it back to you guys uh, for some closing remarks, maybe starting with uh, Dr. Uh, Martinez Bianchi. Is there anything that we should be taking away? Well, I think it is ironic that the Hispanic community lacks access to healthcare given their significant contribution to the labor force and the economy of the country. We know that Hispanics are the highest employed of all adult men in the country yet they are the least likely to have health insurance. So we need to work on insurance accessibility. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted many disparities that already existed for the Latino community and the urgency of addressing them cannot be ignored. We need to work on cross-sectoral synergy towards health equity goals. Thank you so much. And, and Rina, would you like to also uh, uh, give closing remarks on you know, what we should be taking away from this. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, at Walgreens, we've been we've been very humbled to be a part as a pharmacist myself, all of our pharmacists and our technicians have been humbled to be a part of the the pandemic response, maybe from offering testing services to offering um, vaccination services and now being ready to offer a booster. One key component, though, is to ensure that we're driving equitable access to care across the board. And so um, being able to ensure that we continue on our three big pillars. One is driving equitable access through our mobile clinics and being in communities and socially vulnerable communities. The second is ensuring we're educating and leveraging partnerships to do that. Um, we can't do it alone. So leveraging community thought leaders, 
faith-based organizations, organizations like LULAC and, um, you know, like we had spoken earlier with media um, participation, just to ensure that we're getting the message out with thought leaders on the importance of vaccination. And then third, making sure that we're reducing barriers, may it be cost, transportation, um, making sure that we're even just speaking in, uh, making sure that all of our materials are in languages that everyone understands. So, um, you know, we're committed to the cause. We're, we're definitely, um, um, you know, humbled again to be a part of the response, and we look forward to being able to continue the traction that we've been able to have. Thank you. And, and Dr. Morillo, what, what should we be taking away? What are important takeaways? Yeah, I, a big one is that, uh, that the healthcare infrastructure that we have in this country is not good enough. Uh, you know, we need to make major improvements, and I think we already started uh, diversifying our, our healthcare workforce. Uh, is one area that we talked about it. The other one is making access uh, uh, possible through telehealth, digital convenience at home. Uh, the third one is uh, uh, engaging people in their own care. It, healthcare can no longer be, here's your prescription, see you back in three months, is this is what you can do for your health, and this is how I can help you to achieve that. Building healthier community is one of our uh, top goals. So going out there, partnering, we, we talk extensively about partnerships, partnering with local communities, making communities health uh, better. And the last point I wanna make is, is one that I really liked about with Martinez Bianchi that we fully support and that I think is fair. We no, can no longer depend on a very tired and busy uh, physician to provide care. We need to extend the, facilitate extended care uh, in Promotora de Salud. I personally benefited from one when I was practicing in Colombia, having someone go out to the rural communities, checking vaccinations, uh, status, blood pressures, and so on. We need to do more of that in the country, and we can actually facilitate the economic platform so that that kid is recognized if by uh, for someone who's actually community-based, someone who doesn't require extensive training, but someone who can really provide a lot of value to improving uh, care within our communities. Absolutely, so important our community health workers that we support them and we fund them and we, you know, support them any way we can really, not just financially. Um, and Dr. Terrazas, to sort of conclude, I know a lot of our experts here took a lot of uh, subjects here, but if there <laughs> is anything that you could also include to, for a takeaway, you know, what would what would that be? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'd like to um, build on the um, comments I made earlier about information. You know, we, we definitely need to have the information at our fingertips to make the right decisions. And, you know, that includes um, you know, lobbying for increased uh, funding for public health, um, you know, with uh, the, the variants that we've seen um, um, <clears throat> gaining ground in, in the United States as well as other countries, you know, we need to answer questions of how do the variants respond to vaccination, you know, um, um, and, and how do we um, get, get sufficient levels of testing that we can um, positively and confidently track the movement of, of these variants, because this is going to become very important as we move um, further into the pandemic. And uh, um, um, and uh, we need the ability to know um, if any variants are arising that are uh, immune evasive, for example. Um, so again, you know, partnering with uh, with public health, partnering with the communities to increase access to testing is going to be very important as we continue on with the pandemic. Absolutely, sequencing those variants and you know, with the high rates of transmission, we expect more variants to probably pop up. Hopefully nothing immuno escaping, that would be very scary, but um, yes, definitely very important in testing and all important po points from our panelists. Thank you so much for taking the time to participate and give uh, you know your insights on this important topic. Um, that about wraps it up for us. And of course, thank you to everyone at the conference for attending our session. Um, we encourage you to attend the next session on 21st century technology and innovation in American energy. Also, please keep tweeting about the summit at hashtag CHCIHHM21. That's 2 1. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for attending, and also thank you to our panelists. <laughs>